Guys, thank you for coming today. I wanted to start out by talking a little bit about where this presentation and the ideas of this presentation come from. So that as you go through the process, you understand all the research that went into it and a lot of the different real world application. So this is kind of an odd pairing for a presentation. I'm a, a head of sales for HF Scientific and Chris is an integration or the president of an integration firm out of Oklahoma. But it really came from some interactions as he was designing chloramines plants and doing measurement and he would come to me and ask questions and I knew some of the answers but not all of the answers, right? Yep. And then we would go through and do a lot of different research to find out, you know, how do we do this part of that process? And then we would find out as part of that that the, the assumptions that we've all had or the things that we've all been taught in a perfect world don't actually work in the real world. And so this was really a labor of love and a lot of research and a lot of late nights talking about these things. And so the goal of the presentation today is to learn the best practices to apply chloramines, to understand the unique issues which arise in the distribution system due to chloramination, and then to have the tools and the knowledge to mitigate the nitrification and the water quality breakdown. Yeah, and as Julie said, this was a, uh, a labor born out of confusion, I think. <laughs> maybe maybe, good way maybe to, that's a to better way to put it. it. Yeah, because uh, uh, I really got into the water treatment industry about 25 years ago, and prior to that, it was mostly energy sector, refinery automation and offshore uh, automation. And when I became involved in, in water treatment, uh, you know, I assumed that everybody, you know, must be an expert in everything, and so the the information that I was told about treatment from chief plant operators, I just took as gospel. And over the years of providing more and more instrumentation and automation for water treatment, a lot of things begin to not quite add up and didn't make sense from an engineering perspective. And you know, unfortunately, I was trained as an electrical engineer, not a chemical engineer, as, as Julie is. So. Uh, this, this ended up uh, creating a great deal of research for me and a great deal of confusion. And I ended up way deeper in textbooks than I ever wanted to be. And that's where I started asking Julie more and more questions about why does this work the way it does? Let's research this. Let's do some science. Yeah, I think so. So we're going to start the process uh, around a discussion of why we chloraminate, right? And, and so as part of that, we'll go through a brief history of the chloramination and then we're going to dig down into how do we implement it at the plant level and the measurement and control strategies we're going to use. And we'll go from there to the distribution system, which is often ignored, right? We, we do it at the plant and we think, okay, we're good to go. We don't really have to address anything that happens in the distribution system. But we're going to talk about that as part of this process, which for me was kind of eye-opening. And then we'll have a question and answer session at the end. So what are disinfection byproducts? Disinfection byproducts are a class of chemical formed by the reaction of a disinfectant with bromide or a naturally occurring organic matter, such as decaying vegetation, fish, or other organisms present in the source water. We often refer to the precursors of disinfection byproducts as TOC. And the EPA issued the stage one and stage two disinfectant byproduct rules in the late 90s and early 2000s, and we're still seeing plants make the changes in the water industry to meet these rules. The current regulated DBPs are haloacetic acid and total trihalomethanes, which from here forward we'll call TTHMs and HAA5s. And the reaction of chlorine with the TOC in the source water is driven mainly by two things, time and heat. So the longer the sample spins in the distribution system and the hotter the water is in the distribution system, the more DBPs will form before the sample reaches the customer's tap. And that's where we measure for DBPs. So where we see the hot spots for DBP problems are the hotter states and the more rural states. So Florida is certainly a hot state. Southern California hot. Texas kind of has the double whammy, right? Because it's got the heat, but it's also got a lot of rural area where you're shipping water and water has a lot of age in these rural systems. So how do we deal with disinfection byproducts? What do we do for that? What would we do about that? <laughs> well, obviously, you know, removal of TOCs from the source water is the primary concern here, but it's unfortunately not what we always get to deal with. That's right. I mean, that's the obvious answer, right, is to just take everything out of the water and then put a lot of things back to prevent corrosion. But the plants that have chosen to do that, there are a lot of different ways to do it. We can do it with membranes. We can do it with ion exchange, granular activated carbon. 
And we can also do it with just maintenance and media changes in our existing plant or by using an RO system. But we're here today to really talk about one of the other options, and that's to switch your form of disinfectant to chloramines from free chlorine. Um, another option that I've heard of people using, which is a pretty expensive option, is flushing, right? It's reducing the amount of time the water spends in the distribution system as part of this, but because we're actually reducing that time, we're, we're flushing out a lot of water and wasting a lot of water into either a storm system or onto the ground. So what is chloramination? Since the point of this presentation is to focus on this specific way to manage DBPs, and we've heard a lot about chloramination in the industry in the last 10 years, right? But chloramination is when you combine chlorine and ammonia in a specific ratio in a water system to form chloramines. And the goal of that is to actually form monochloramine, not dichloramine or trichloramine. Why do we do this? Because chloramines, once, once the chlorine is bonded to ammonia, it's hard to rip that chlorine off of it to bond with the TOC and form a disinfection byproduct. You can still form some disinfection byproducts, but you will not form nearly as many if you're using chloramines instead of free chlorine. Uh, to ensure that the majority of the disinfectant is monochloramine, you should operate with a free ammonia residual a very small free ammonia residual, as small as possible, but still operate with a free ammonia residual. So as we, we began to research this, uh, we, everyone has seen the standard breakpoint chloramination curve where we have a, a increasing chloramine level as we increase our chlorine to ammonia ratio. But it, there are many things about that that really didn't add up or make sense when we got to doing some of the, the analysis of the water and doing some experimentation with different pieces of equipment. And what we learned through our research and our experimentation is there's quite a bit more to the whole story than just a chlorine to ammonia ratio and trying to re retain that uh, small free residual ammonia. Yeah, it's like we were taught 80% of the story, right? And, and like it was a very one-dimensional solution, but really there are a lot of different parts to the solution. So I'm not going to get to that quite yet, but we're going to discuss that a little bit later in the right, presentation. More details coming. Yep, absolutely. Why would we use chloramines, Ms. <laughs> Dawson? <laughs> exactly. So long before DBPs were a buzzword in the industry and the EPA published the disinfection byproducts rules, People used chloramines as early as the 1930s, and the reason they used them was for the persistence in the system, right? So in these rural areas, and, and we talked about Texas earlier as one of the hot spots, Texas was one of the first states to do chloramination, and it's because of the persistence in the system. And so if you want a residual at your tap, and that tap is 30 miles down the road, and you're trying to free chlorinate, that's not going to get there, right? We're going to have no free chlorine residual, and we're going to have to do a lot of booster pump stations along the way. Whereas with chloramines, you can actually juice the chloramine high enough, and it stays long enough that you can get there without doing a booster station. Yep, and then we started doing a little bit of research going, okay, so if chlorine, chloramines are so wonderful, why are they not used everywhere? It seems like it's the, the solution right. everyone's moving Right, if it's towards. the best solution, let's just use it in primary disinfection, secondary disinfection, let's use it everywhere. But it's when we have free chlorine in the distribution that DBP formation is escalated. And the EPA actually did a study with different plants throughout the U.S. where they changed either the primary disinfectant, the secondary disinfectant, or both, and recorded the changes that they saw in the DBP formation. They didn't find any reduction in DBPs when chloramine was used as a primary disinfectant, but changing from chlorine chlorine to chlorine chloramines caused a decrease in the formation of DBPs. Additionally, chloramines are not as strong of an oxidant as free chlorine. So what does that mean? That means if we're going to use chloramines as our primary disinfectant, we're going to have to have a longer contact time in the primary disinfection chamber than we would if we're using free chlorine and we're not seeing the benefits of DBP reduction there. They're also more difficult to control and measure, and as we said, it's been shown to cause no additional reductions in DBPs. So what are the challenges with chloramination, right? We said it's more difficult to control and measure, but what does that mean and why is that? There's twice as much chemistry to feed, right? Now I'm feeding two different chemicals, and that doesn't include pH control as well, and there's more items to source, and more analyzers to maintain. So also nitrification. What is nitrification? We haven't really talked about that yet, 
but we talked about the need to measure or to run with a small free ammonia residual. When we're running with a small free ammonia residual, what is ammonia great at? We know this from the wastewater side of the business, but ammonia is a great bug food, right? So we have nitrification, which occurs and forms a microbiological film on the inside of the pipes. The higher that free ammonia level, the more microbial we have forming in the system, and that comes from nitrification. And also there are just additional costs associated with all this extra equipment that we have to use and maintain. So, you know, as a, as a part of doing research for this, we wanted to, you know, look at the different methodologies and different uh, mechanical techniques of forming chloramines in a plant environment. And it really kind of comes down to there, there's two different techniques, either the in-clear well chloramination or generating uh, chloramines outside of the plant. Uh, in this slide, we're looking at what I typically see as a retrofitted plant where the chloramines are being generated in clear well. And we have the, the chlorine feed and the primary disinfection chamber and then the clear well area. And in an in clear well chloramination system, we're adding you know, our, our primary chlorine. In many cases, that may be the only chlorine feed in some of the plants that I've seen. They're just carrying a very, very high chlorine level through the disinfection chamber. And then we're going to measure the available free chlorine after the disinfection load is met. We're going to add makeup chlorine to get to whatever level we want. And then we're going to add our ammonia by ratio in clear well. And then at the end of the system, we're going to take our measurements with our analytical equipment for total chlorine and free ammonia so that we can adjust our chemical feeds as we go back into it. And I know one of the things you've talked about in the past on this is, you know, actually getting the chemistry into the system and well mixed. And how do you do that, right? And exactly. And that is one of the challenges of in clear well chloramination. Kind of difficult to say over and over. It is. <laughs> um, but as you can well imagine, getting the chemicals distributed across the large body of water uh, can be very challenging. And it can it can quite frankly make the, the results less than desirable just because of the, the flows and the currents and the mixing that are naturally going to take place in a large body of water. And so typically you would like to have some sort of a mixing or wide area distribution system if you're doing in clear, clear well chloramination. Uh, I also have some customers that have a weir type uh, system where coming from their disinfection chamber into the, the primary clear well, they have an overflow weir and they're able to put like a spray bar, uh, adding chemical okay. and mixing at that point. And so it gives them a little better uh, mixing throughout the system. So this doesn't sound like it's the best way to do this. Why does anybody do it that way? Yeah, it, it is certainly not ideal, but it is by far the easiest to retrofit. Uh, as you might imagine, if this was a free chlorine plant, I mean, you're literally talking about poking some holes in a clear well to add uh, chemical distribution systems into it or chemical injection systems into an existing structure. So it's by far the, the easiest and least expensive. Okay, so really if you're under a budget, right? If you're under budgetary constraints, you would want to do it this way? Uh, budget can be a little bit of it, but it's probably not the driving factor because in an ideal design, as we'll see in the, uh, uh, the next slide, you can see that there's more physical area required to do this in the way that we would perfectly do it if we had, you know. So it's really a space design. constraint issue. So it's a space constraint and a retrofit constraint in that most older plants, legacy plants, are just not designed for multiple areas of chemical treatment. They're kind of the dump and go swimming pool concept. Okay. That makes sense. Well, do you want to talk about the best way to do it then? So as far as a results-based system, uh, doing a post clear well chloramination seems to work really, really well. Uh, it's just like in, your, in the previous slide, in a typical plant, we're chlorinating, going into a disinfection chamber. Once the disinfection load is met, we are storing that chlorinated water in the clear well. So coming out of the clear well, we can go ahead and take our free chlorine measurement at that point. We can add makeup chlorine to get to our desired final set point and then ammonia by ratio, and then analyze our water to see what our total, total chloramines, uh, 
and our free ammonia are because we can trim that and make it up right there. I think probably one of the most important aspects of this type of a design is no matter which way we go, we are dosing by mass via a flow meter. But in a post-clear well situation, we're actually measuring the water that we are treating right now. So we are accurately dosing chemicals into very specifically measured water, whereas in the previous uh, scenario, we're dosing water into a pool, right? We're and we're dosing it based on a makeup flow meter, Correct. Not, not an outlet flow meter. That's right. And that, okay. that clear well may be rising, it may be falling, the flow through it may be rapid, may be slow, but we're, we're dosing based upon water that went into the clear well, not that we're actually measuring. And so it makes a big difference. And as you can see in the next slide, I actually took uh, a couple customers' plants and to make sure that these were apples to apples comparison, it was same treatment technique technologies and methodologies, uh, same analytical instrumentation, same SCADA software with same data logging intervals. And these are 24-hour periods of monochloramine readings. And as you can see, the in clear well plant, which had dramatically fluctuating water flows throughout the day and the, and the night, and as towers filled and towers fell, versus a plant that has a post-clear well chlorination system, similar flow fluctuations, but we're able to hold those uh, chemical feeds much, much more precisely. Yeah, it looks like that one was within like 0.2 yeah. ppm. Yeah, very, uh, very little fluctuation. Of course, there's, 24 there's hours. One more nice additional little perk of that out of clear well chlorine, uh, chloramination uh -huh. is should you have a plant upset that affected the chemical feeds, you know, say, heaven forbid, a loss of your chlorination system, rather than having hundreds of thousands or millions of gallons of uh, bad water in your clear well that, have to, that you, know, you don't have a good way of dealing with, if your chemical additions are being done as you're drawing water out of that clear well, you can at least hit it with chemistry right there and basically rapidly fix your problem uh, in a much more effective way than having to dump and retreat you know, a million gallon clear well. So if you lost primary chlorination, could you fix that with post clear well? Well, I think we're, we're getting into some details that are probably more regulatory gotcha. uh, as far as the primary disinfection CTs, but the answer is yes, you could hit it with chlorine at the point of coming out of the clear well. You could at least get well. it to your you could probably distribution make it, system. Right, you could get it into the distribution system with some chlorine residual, which is certainly better than any alternative. Absolutely. So earlier we said there was a lot more to chloramination than just controlling the ratios, right? Here we've kind of talked about controlling the ratios and that measurement and control. But now I think we should get into some of the more specifics, right? We said pH was going to be a, a big factor in this. Yeah. And I think this is kind of the fun part of the presentation for us. I think it uh, was probably one of the more eye-opening areas for me, and I believe mm -hmm. for you, and probably for everybody who will be watching this, uh, you know, because we, we all have seen some very generic, very standardized training materials that are provided to treatment plant operators and are generally well known. It's the breakpoint right? chlorination right. curve, right? All of the stuff that we've always taken for granted. And so, you know, there, there's some things that we know, like we were always told, uh, you know, we want to be at a pH of eight or above uh, for our chloramine formation to make that ideal. We're going to get into a little more details on why that is in a moment because it's rather fascinating. Uh, but we probably should talk just very briefly about pH control in a water plant uh, because since we're trying to maintain this pH for the purpose of optimal chloramine formulation, we ideally want to make any of those adjustments you know, in, in an area where it impacts that appropriately. So since we're adding other chemicals to our plant, we'd like to make the uh, pH adjustments after those other chemicals have added. For example, chlorine can affect the pH pretty dramatically. So we would like to make our pH adjustments, if at all possible, after our primary chlorination is done. Now the reality is, is a lot of plants just are not designed or built in a manner to handle that. And so we just have to deal with what we have to deal with. But if you are designing or retrofitting, these are the ideal locations to do things. So, 
I think we'll jump back into our, our chloramines uh, just a little bit here. So again, you know, when, when I first became involved in treatment plant operation and started getting more into the, uh, the chemistry, uh, you know, I, was, I was always told, you know, we've, we've got that uh, breakpoint chlorination curve, and if we go past that, we're going to generate dichloramines and trichloramines, and then eventually hit breakpoint and go back to free chlorine. Well, that's just not what I saw when I started doing some experimentation with this. And this was another one of those uh, uh, late night, a uh, couple of beers teams meetings uh, with Julie is why, why is my chlorine analyzer not reading anything in places where I should have this stuff? Or I'm, I'm right, reading I know I'm that feeding don't chlorine, make sense. but I lost my ammonia, so what's going on? Yeah, right? If, if, if because of, if you had dichloramine or trichloramine, would, you would at least read some of that with the chlorine analyzer. Right, and we know from experimentation that we did several years ago by intentionally forming dichloramines and trichloramines mm -hmm. that our analyzers read that. Yet, I had an experience where I had a plant completely crash, and they thought that they had lost their chlorine feed, and when in reality they had lost their ammonia feed, but their monochloramine numbers from their analyzer crashed and their total chlorine numbers crashed and basically went to zero. And so. And their pH was an 8.3? Yeah, yeah. pH was a low 8s. So some further investigation revealed some new information that does not seem to be um, traditionally taught in water treatment mm -hmm. classes. I would agree. And that is, if we look, we have our three speciations. Of, of chloramines here, trichloramine, dichloramine, monochloramine, and if you look, it's very difficult to get trichloramines to form unless you're in pHs below a five. I mean, they just almost don't exist. And even dichloramines really are pretty much bottomed out by the time you get up into the sevens. Conversely, it's almost impossible to make monochloramines below a pH of about six. So. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was very, very interesting information to learn. And it also really explains a couple of things, but more importantly, it means if we're running a monochloramine plant and we're holding our pH in the you know, eight plus range where we should be, those uh, pesky dye and trichloramines are really a lot less of an issue than many plant operators believed them to be at the time. Yeah, absolutely. So, Anyway, there's, there's a tremendous amount of fascinating chemistry that, uh, <laughs> and many rabbit holes that we ran down during research uh, just in this particular the, area, but this was pretty fascinating to yeah, delve into. Yeah, this was part of the interesting and eye-opening thing for us, and, and what we determined that, we, you know, we really never gave the what had happened, right? Yeah. What happened was we were forming nitrogen and trichloride, mm -hmm. uh, which does not read on a chlorine analyzer, unlike dichloramine and trichloramine. Yep. So now, to get us out of the rabbit holes, uh, I'm going to start talking about the measurement, right? And this is really my hot button and really what I enjoy. And to, first, to set the basis of that, I'm going to talk about colorimetry and how colorimetry works, right? And, and Beer Lambert's law defines colorimetry for us. But what we really know is that we shoot a light across a cell filled with a sample. We measure the absorbance of that sample for the light, and that's what we call our zero reading, right? That's the baseline absorbance based on the color in the sample and any other, con you know, properties of the sample. That's your baseline absorbance. Now we're going to add a chemical that we'll call a reagent to that same sample cell. When we add that, it's going to turn a color depending on what compound we're trying to measure. We'll add DPD for chlorine or salicylate for the phenate method. Whatever it is, we're going to add a reagent to that, and then we're going to shoot the same light across the same path, and we're going to measure how much light makes it to the other side. The differential in the light that we shoot and the light that got there is what we call absorbance, and that, that absorbance is linear across the measurement range with the concentration of whatever it is we're trying to measure. So chlorine measurement, now we'll talk specifically about DPD chemistry. We just talked about how does colorimetry work, but for DPD... DPD we, is what? DPD is N-N-diethylphenylalamine. Bravo. I, I'm so proud of myself. I have to look that up every time. But it's the chemistry used to measure chlorine colorimetrically. 
And DPD turns the sample into a pink color, and everyone's really familiar with this measurement, right? It's the standard used in your handheld that you measure chlorine with out in the field, and for most plants, it's the standard used at the plant level and in the distribution level. But basically, the darker the pink color, the more chlorine is in the sample, and the more light is absorbed by the sample. So less light reaches the detector on the other side of the measurement cell. And one of the things I want to address is how do, how do we handle pH changes with DPD? Well, the DPD method automatically adjusts the pH, so it's not pH dependent, right? It doesn't matter if you're running an eight, a seven, a six and a half, a nine, whatever that is, we've got plenty of buffer capability in the DPD chemistry to cover that, so it's not a pH dependent measurement. So now, just like we talked about Beer Lambert's law and how do we use colorimetry to measure chlorine, I want to talk a little bit about the chlorine dissociation curve. So chlorine speciates over a pH and really between that 6.8 and 8.5 is where we see the steep portion of that curve. And before the 6.8, and we see it, you know, at the 6.8 it's about 88% hypochlorous acid. And by the time I get down to an 8.5, it's about 12% hypochlorous acid, and the rest is the hypochlorite ion. So the percent of hypochlorous acid versus the hypochlorite ion in the sample is based on the pH of the sample. And why do we care? Because we want to talk about amperometric measurement of chlorine, right? The standard amperometric sensor design consists of two electrodes, an anode and a cathode. And the probe measures the change in current caused by the chemical reduction of the hypochlorous acid at the cathode. So the amperometric sensor was EPA approved in the early 2000s, and the drinking water industry swung very hard towards that, because what we heard when we said probe-based technology was no reagents, right? And, and what we associated that to was no reagents meant no total cost of operation, right? I, I just buy this thing, hang it on the wall, and it works. And also, we didn't really dig into the chemistry. Everybody said, this is the new chlorine analyzer. You can use it anywhere. Nobody said, hey, these are the applications where it really fits, right? So remember that the amperometric sensor only actually measures the hypochlorous acid. It uses the dissociation curve shown earlier and here to determine the percent of the hypochlorous acid versus the hypochlorite ion to truly give a chlorine reading that includes both species. And the way it does that is to take the pH and then go back and do the math. So this can actually introduce a tremendous amount of error, and I kind of categorize those into three different errors. And the first and the worst, in my opinion, is that some manufacturers offer amperometric technology which doesn't even have pH as an option, or it's not a requirement as part of the analyzer. And if you're not measuring the pH, then you don't know where you are on that curve to make an accurate assessment, which means that I have to walk out every day, calibrate it to a handheld, and it's accurate as long as my pH is rock steady stable, and as long as I'm at the top portion of that curve, right? Maybe between a seven and a seven and a half. And the second error that I see, and one of my hot buttons, is that your pH probe must be very accurate for a correct chlorine measurement. And conventional pH probes have notoriously had issues with the drift and accuracy in a very clean sample, such as surface water. There are manufacturers out there that make high purity pH probes, and they work really well, but I haven't seen a manufacturer that puts them on an amperometric chlorine analyzer. It seems like they would, but we don't really see that. And also, they're just very pH dependent. So if I'm at the top of that speciation curve, say between a 7 and a 7.5, and then I can, I can get a decent enough measurement, right? There's enough concentration of hypochlorous acid that I can get a decent enough measurement with a pH to come up with the answer. But if I'm towards the bottom of that curve, say down around the 8 or the 8.3, where my chloramine plant is going to operate, then my measurement, the actual species I can measure is so low, even just based on, if we're just talking about total chlorine, it's still so low that I can't get an accurate measurement there. So the other thing I would say about amperometric is it requires calibration. We didn't really talk about that with DPD, but DPD, because we're taking that zero every time, we don't require calibration. It's kind of a self-calibrating. I know what the absorbance was in the blank sample, and I know what the absorbance is going forward. But here, I have to calibrate it, and I don't use generally a two-point calibration. I just do an offset. I go out there, I run my DPD handheld, and I tell my analyzer what I want it to say. 
And that's not a great calibration because as your probe degrades, you don't get any slope changes there. You only get an offset. And most of this discussion has been around the reagentless version of the Ampere metric. Um, and I will say that there are some versions of Ampere metric that use a reagent to adjust the pH, and those actually tend to work pretty well, right? And they often use very benign reagents like vinegar to drop the pH. But now I want to talk about specifically in chloramines plants. And so we're going to talk about ORP. And Chris says I'll get in a rabbit hole with ORP. That's one of my, my hot buttons. But what is ORP? ORP is oxidation reduction potential. And do you remember how we said the amperometric probe worked? It worked by the reduction of the hypochlorous acid at the cathode. So now let's look at the oxidation reduction potential of chlorine versus that of chloramines. So if I'm trying to measure reduction potential at that cathode or the actual reduction at that cathode, I can do that much easier with chlorine than I can with chloramines. So as you can see, with chloramine having a much lower ORP, regardless of your sample pH, if you're trying to measure chloramine, amperometric is not going to work. And, and we actually had this experience fell it relatively recently where mm -hmm. somebody came up and they said, listen, we've been trying amperometric for a long time and and we've used it in other places and it worked, but we can't get it to work at all in a chloramine plant. Can you tell us why, right? Yeah, yeah, can can you help us? One of the things that prompted this presentation. Yep, absolutely. So we've talked about how we measure chlorine and the different ways to do that and the right way to do that in a chloramine plant. Now we're going to talk about how do we actually measure chloramine, total ammonia, and free ammonia online. And there are two different ways to do that in the industry. And the first and by far the most common is the phenate method. And so in the phenate method, it's colorimetry, like we talked about with Beer's, Beer Lambert's law earlier. And so we're going to turn the sample a color. So we add buffer and indicator to the sample, and we're going to measure all the monochloramine, and then we're going to express it as chlorine. That sample turns green, and the same way we do with DPD, we shoot that light through there and see how much is absorbed so we know how much is in the sample cell. Next, we're going to take the exact same sample, the exact same water, and we're going to add chlorinating solution to it before we run the same reaction. So what is chlorinating solution to? It's going to take any free ammonia that I have in the sample and push that to be monochloramine. And as it pushes that to be monochloramine, then when we run the same reaction, we get total ammonia. Because there's no real good way to measure free ammonia, now we have these two values that we can take the total ammonia minus the monochloramine expressed as ammonia to get the free ammonia, which is really what we use to control our plant. The other chloramine measurement that's out in the industry right now is a UV measurement. And, and I want to tell you that I'm not an expert on this one. So this is kind of pulled from the manufacturer's website there. But monochloramine has a strong light absorbance signature in the ultraviolet wavelength range, and the intensity of which is proportionate to the monochloramine concentration. And, and I know that this method requires calibration, and you have a lot more experience with it than I do. Do you yeah. want to talk about that a little bit? Well, not really, but I will. <laughs> <laughs> so, as Julie mentioned, this is a, um, a, an analyzer that's based on some patented and proprietary technology, so nobody outside of the factory is really an expert on it, but I do have some experience actually operating these analyzers. And while I can't really speak to the internal technology, I can say that they are uh, you know, seem to be a, you know, a reliable, stable analyzer, but they have some very unique calibration challenges, uh, apparently due to the technology that's used, in that uh, they're not really calibrated necessarily against a reference. Uh, they, they are calibrated just against a sample, almost like you were talking about earlier with the ampiometric analyzers with the pH correction, how they just required a more regular calibration due well, to drift Well, basically, you just stability. tell it what you want it to read, and then it'll give you that answer, that's, right? That's more or less the case, yep. Okay, so you haven't found these to be accurate, or, or at least not to be able to check the accuracy with existing standards. So I believe that kind of the point of these analyzers was not accuracy. It was to monitor for uh, trends and changes, but I don't believe that they're really mon uh, marketed as a, a specific accurate laboratory type instrument. Okay, good to know. And I think now you were going to talk about, we've talked about how do we measure all these chemicals, but how do we feed these chemicals, right? As we're Absolutely. going through the design, what are the right choices to make to make the operations plant easier to maintain, right, and to control and to troubleshoot? 
Yeah. So we've uh, you know we've talked about the aspects of the chemical feeds that you know can impact uh, our, our outcome, and you know there are there's things that are more critical in a chloramine plant than in a chlorine plant, and you know this the we have multiple chemical feeds as we've discussed. Uh, we have multiple types of chemicals. Uh, you know, one of the things that I wanted to touch on, just based on experience, was chlorine gas versus chlorine in bleach form. Mm -hmm. um, the chlorine gas really has some pretty defined advantages in a chloramine plant in that we generally can feed it fairly linearly uh, with, with fairly accurate systems. Uh, but even more importantly, the, the concentration doesn't degrade like bleach does. Right. So the, 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 the liquid chlorine forms, the bleaches, do tend to degrade fairly rapidly, and especially with temperature, uh, they, can, they can really uh, come apart pretty quickly. So since we're talking about such uh, tight control necessary in a chlorine plant, you know, the, the gas has a, a huge advantage in, in my personal opinion. Plus there's some side advantages. I know everybody kind of thinks bleach is a safer product to deal with, but you do get the outgassing of the product, the release of chlorine gas into the, into the air that everybody's worried about with a gas system. Sure, but you most can walk plants, in a chlorine room and tell if they're using bleach, right? Because yeah. everything's corroded, everything's it's, it's eaten It's corroded, up. it reeks of chlorine, whereas with a properly maintained gas system, uh, for most plants, the entire gas system is a vacuum demand system, so you literally can go you know, any place from the tank on after the, the vacuum regulator and have a leak and not really release gas into the atmosphere, and certainly not over the long term like you do with chlorine bleach breaking down. So you know, the, other, the other component that we talk about is the ammonia. And at least all of the plants that I am familiar with and work at there are using liquid ammonium sulfate, uh, which is a, you know, a, a liquid form of getting the, the ammonia into the water. Mm -hmm. uh, and since it's a liquid, uh, you know, we need to pay a lot of attention to our chemical feed system, our pump technology, and our overall feed system. So the, the feed system does not necessarily get as much respect and, and attention as it should in these plants. And one thing, you know, for example, if you're feeding a liquid from the pump through the, through the plumbing and the piping to wherever we're talking about in the plant, uh, you know, it can be a pretty decent amount of, uh, of plumbing involved there, right? I mean, you can conceivably have hundreds of feet, uh, you know, of, of pipe or PEX line or whatever. And so, you know, we're talking about very, very precise feed rates necessary. And so there's some techniques that I think are beneficial. So for my knowledge, what would be a, a feed rate, right? At, at say a smaller plant or where we're using on the bottom end of those feed sure, rates. Sure, sure. So uh, I have a, one of my customers runs a fairly small plant. It's about a 200,000 gallon per day. And during production, their ammonia, their LAS feed is like three milliliters per minute. So I mean, we're talking a trickle, right? Yeah, absolutely. And so that plant actually shuts down uh, at times and turns back on automatically. And early on, one of the problems that I identified with their feed system, with their chloramine system, was that when the plant was shut down, at the injection quill in the pipe, a little bit of water would creep back into the injection quill and the tubing. And even though it, was, it had a check valve at the chemical pump itself, there's a little flex in the tubing, maybe a little leak by. But you can imagine if you have some tubing and maybe a foot of it is filled with water, if you're only flowing three milliliters per minute, it's going to take a while to flush that back out. Right, you may not see ammonia feed for the first hour you're running. Exactly. And you only run 10 hours a, a day, of, right? Or, or fewer in some cases. Okay. So I really recommend that any of the liquid feed systems have what's called a back pressure valve right at the injection point or as close to it as possible. And okay. what a back pressure valve is, is it's really nothing more exotic than a spring-loaded check valve that requires a certain amount of pressure to overcome or open the valve and allow the chemical to flow. And so what that does is it keeps the entire chemical feed line pressurized, even when there's no liquid flowing through it or very, very little. 
it's always under a constant pressure. And almost all chemical feed pumps like feeding into a constant pressure. Uh, you know, it, it just helps keep that linearity because we're mm -hmm. really looking at overall feed systems that are linear across the range. So if you double the amount of water you're treating, you want that chemical feed system to be doubling the amount of chemical that it's putting in very accurately and be linear across that range. So that means that the, the chemical feed is pretty critical, right? Yeah, it's, it's super critical. And, you know, we're certainly not here today to get into an evaluation of manufacturers, brands, technologies, or anything else. Just to give some, uh, give some general feedback. You know, for example, on, on pumps, we've already talked about they need to be linear. Need to make certain we have appropriate uh, chemical resistance on the components that are in the pump. Uh, for example, you, know, you may not do this, but stainless steel is not resistant to a strong bleach solution. Even though 304 stainless is listed as you know, chlorine safe, interestingly, a strong bleach solution will just eat through stainless steel if it has threads cut in it. So as part of the design, focusing on the specifications around the pump and the true accuracy, right? Instead yes. of just looking at, this is what we've always done, right? We've always used these chemical feed pumps and they've worked fine while we were on free chlorine. But now as we're going to chloramines, that's a more critical thing. So work with your engineer, work with your integrator, whoever it is that you work with as part of that transition to make sure they understand yes. the criticality of it. And some of the, you know, like we already spoke about the, the minuscule feed rates Right. Uh, for some of the ammonia systems. Well, I like to use peristaltic pumps because they generally have a very high turn down ratio. They can feed a creeping, very small flow. Mm -hmm. uh, if you think about the, the various piston pumps or pulsing pumps that we see everywhere in our industry, probably one pulse, maybe more than three milliliters that Absolutely. we were treating. So you may have a pump that's giving you one shot Every, every two minutes every or Every couple three of minutes. minutes. And so your dosing is just not going to be pretty, and you're not going to have a stable uh, result from it. So, you know, now we've kind of covered everything all the way through the plant system, whether it's what chemistry are we dosing, how do we dose it, what are the measurement parameters, and how do we feed it. And now I want to talk about rechloramination, because this is something that we almost don't get into in the industry, right? Like, everybody knows that we've got to have booster stations for our chlorine. And we said one of the benefits of chloramine is that we don't have to boost it at, as often. But we also talked a little bit about nitrification earlier, mm -hmm. right? And, and nitrification is one of the things that can cause problems as we have more free ammonia. So if we're leaving the plant with a 0.06 free ammonia, 0.05, I feel pretty good about it. I'd like to operate as low as possible. But as I am going through the system and using some of the chlorine, that free ammonia is going to trend up. So you may want to go through a rechloramination process so that you don't have as much nitrification. And well, now you get to talk about how to design those. I just my, have to introduce it. My pet topic, one of my favorite topics, because <laughs> this is something that seems like it should be pretty easy. And it actually isn't particularly difficult, but it requires um, some specialized knowledge and well, the feed process is backwards, right? Like that's when you it, when you showed me this, I was like, no, 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 that's wrong. That's yep. backwards. Yep, the feed but process backwards. is backwards to primary treatment in that we are adding nitrogen before chlorine. But the reason that we're doing that is we are measuring that elevated free ammonia, right? And mm -hmm. we're trying not to generate new disinfection byproducts or uh, undesirable species of chloramines here. So we go ahead and we measure that available free ammonia from our natural breakdowns of chloramines in the system. We're going to add an additional ammonia to it, but we're going to add that based upon what we're trying to target for our final chloramines. So if, if we're coming in and we're measuring a monochloramine of one and we're trying to get it to a three, Okay. We're, we're going to calculate all of our boost based upon that 2 ppm uh, increase, but we're trying to react out the existing free ammonia also. So we're going to figure out how much ammonia we would need for our 3 ppm residual. Then we're going to look to see what we actually have available to work with before we add to that, uh, that additional dose of ammonia. Then we're going to add our free chlorine or our, our chlorine in whatever form uh, that we're right, using at this station, whether it's gas or, or bleach, uh, to react out the, 
the combined total of the existing free ammonia plus the ammonia that we've added to generate new chloramines. Now, this all seems fairly simple, but in many cases, this is a relatively small flow that we're treating uh, because of where this would be utilized. I mean, this would be generally a tie-in point between an existing system and a purchase customer. And because of that, everything along here is that much more critical, just like we were talking about, about the, you know, the treatment implant and the, the issues with the pumps and the, and, sure. and the chemical feed systems. When you're talking at, at a small number, this becomes super, super critical. And since there's no intermediate storage or buffer, we're doing this in line, everything's got to be super accurate. And any system that does this has to have the ability to take into account the, the inherent errors in a system like this, like you know, the, the, the variations in load to load of our ammonia. I mean, it's going to vary by multiple percentage points. Sure. Our chemical pumps are always going to have some error uh, in them. Our metering may have some error. So these systems need to, need to be designed with precision and accuracy uh, as, their, you know, as a key ingredient. And then the last thing about doing rechloramination is that this is a very successful, proven way to reduce distribution system nitrification. Because mm -hmm. as, as we know, nitrification is fed by our free ammonia. Right, and it's so a bug food. It's, it's a bug food, and it's going to be a naturally occurring bug food in any chloramine distribution system. So by doing your rechloramination, since you're reacting out that buildup of free ammonia, we can just stomp on nitrification events uh, as long as we can, can hold that chloramine above a two and keep the ammonia down low, uh, you essentially can stop any nitrification. So really what we're saying here, the benefit to the utility, in my opinion, of rechloramination is that I can go longer between chlorine burns or free burns. People have different names for them, right? Yep. But when I do a chlorine burnout, that costs time. I'm switching over my whole plant. I have to do public notification and have that communication with people. If I'm going through and doing the right things in rechloramination, I'm going to have less nitrification. And when I have less nitrification, I can do those less often. Exactly. Fewer customer complaints, taste and odor, odor complaints. And you know, if you can properly control that free ammonia and maintain those residuals, I mean, that means you're, the, the burnouts or free burns can become a, a data-driven item rather than a calendar event-driven item. Right. And you can, I mean, there's been some pretty good research. Right, if you see that free ammonia spike, then hey, I know I have nitrification going well, on, and, right? and even, even more than that, I mean, the, the monitoring for nitrification is, is a whole other rabbit hole that's easy <laughs> to run down, but there's not one specific thing that gives you the indication that you have a nitrification event going on. I mean, you have to look at a number of parameters. You're looking mm -hmm. at pH changes. You are looking at that food source availability, but that also can go completely the well, other way. And, and degradation into, of your chloramine, right? Yeah. So degradation. If you see the mono degrade. Yep. Degradation and, and loss of chlorine or chloramines is probably one of the key indicators, but in and of itself, not the indicator. It means you need to go look a little bit further. Maybe this will be our next presentation. Maybe our next presentation <laughs> is how to determine nitrification and deal with that. Yep. But, but guys, we really appreciate um, your time today, and we hope that this was useful to you. I think now we're going to close, and we'll have a question and answer session.